Hello, and welcome to the Henry Schein webinar series on COVID-19. I'm Dr. Gary Severance with Henry Schein, and today we start our second year providing dental professionals an update on the pandemic and the pending recovery. In this episode, Dr. Resnick will provide an update on the vaccine manufacturing in the United States, the threat levels of the COVID variants, and much, much more. Dr. Resnick, welcome. Uh, thank you, Dr. Severance, and it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, especially today, because our presentation is definitely on the positive side. Um, an article came out from the New York Times actually today that I read on how the press is really focusing on the negative of what we're seeing, how there are 15 states that have an increase, how we're worried about the variants, um, how some places aren't doing good with vaccination and other people are. And then there's other news that comes through that I'm sure we're all aware of that is not good news. Uh, today, for the most part, I have actually good news to share. And I think it's important to focus on the good, but remembering that we still have come such a long way. When we started these webinars a year ago, people's offices were shutting down. Our patients were gone. Um, we were trying to figure out ways of communicating. We were trying to figure out was it aerosol transmission um, or airborne transmission. We were worried about fomites and could you touch paper in your office and eliminating all the paper. And we really have come quite some ways since then. We know the causes. We know how to prevent this. We now have vaccines that work. Our worlds are becoming more normal. I checked our clinic data. And when this uh, pandemic first hit, we were only seeing emergency, once we reopened, we were only seeing emergency patients and doing removable pros. Uh, we wanted to make sure we weren't really generating any aerosols. But I got a phone call immediately, um, right around the time of uh, our in the middle of March from my um, one up, the chief medical officer at Grady Health System, Dr. Jansen, saying that me and my staff needed to put on fit tested N95s immediately. And so we started talking about getting N95s and different levels of masks and all the different things that we have really overcome over this last year. Um, I look at where our production is in the last quarter, and we're at about 86% of our normal volume here. So we still have some patient hesitancy coming back, but um, I have a full staff. Um, we're moving to that new clinic, and that's why I really wanted to focus on what's good about where we're at. We're gonna look from an economic standpoint on where the pharmaceutical companies are with man, uh, manufacturing um, vaccines, because that's exceeding um, expectations. We'll talk a little bit about the number of vaccines that we're giving per day, which again is exceeding expectations. And we'll talk about literally are we getting close to a point where we can have fun again, where we can go back to some normal life? Now, as far as dentistry, we have changed. Our infection control procedures will now always involve, at least to some degree, addressing aerosols. And I think that's important. Um, I remember uh, we used face shields here at the beginning, and I think I've told you in the past that I have excellent dental assistants, and I was amazed at the splatter and things that ended up on my face shield after doing a crown prep or after doing multiple restorative procedures. Now, that stuff no longer gets on my face shield or through my N95. It goes into an extra oral aerosol evacuation system. So we really have done a gone a great deal. We have uh, the trust of our patients. We've had minor outbreaks in dental offices. We know that uh, from the ADHA and ADA study, about 3.1% of dental hygienists, which is about what we see in the normal population, have tested positive. So there is good news, and I really want to focus on that. If you look at COVID-19 vaccine manufacturing in the U.S., it, according to the Wall Street Journal, it is really moving ahead. We're expected to produce 132 million doses this month, which is extraordinary because it's tripling last month's figure and it's helping with our vaccination drive. Um, Pfizer, which started off pretty slow with its partner BioNTech and Moderna, 
have raised output by gaining experience, just like we gained experience with how we're going to manage our patients, how we're going to manage our offices and with communication, et cetera. By their gaining experience, they learned how to scale up production lines and taking other steps like making certain raw materials on their own because you've heard with certain items over the last year, we've had some issue getting some of the raw materials in. Pfizer figured out how to stretch uh, scarce supplies of special filters needed for vaccine production by recycling them. Moderna shortened the time it needed to inspect and package newly manufactured vials of its vaccine. So experience on the manufacturing side has literally helped us produce where we are today. Uh, Johnson & Johnson, their uh, subcompany Janssen, uh, recently launched another COVID-19 vaccine that we've talked about. It's the one-shot vaccine, and it's teaming up with a competitor, Merck, which I think is, again, a remarkable sign on how we can come together as business, as professionals, as society to make things better. So they're teaming up with Merck to increase production. The U.S. government has helped vaccine makers access supplies under the Defense Production Act. Um, the Defense Production Act was used to provide $105 million in funding to help Merck and company make doses of J&J's vaccine and to expedite materials used in its production. The U.S. monthly output for the three authorized vaccines is expected to reach 132 million doses for March, nearly triple that 48 million uh, from February, and this is by analysts from Evercore ISI. If we look at the 121.4 million doses that have been administered out of the 156 million doses distributed, you can see how we started off slowly in January, things picked up in February, and now we're on a very positive trajectory. Um, in Atlanta, where we have had some issues with getting people, and Georgia getting people vaccinated, um, the Mercedes Dome Stadium is opening up, and they have 6,000 appointments per day. So you're seeing this around the country where you have mass vaccination sites. You also see our profession stepping up into the uh, table. Um, we're doing a vaccination event on the 24th and on April 17th, and honestly, I will be there volunteering to vaccinate our patients, which is something I never thought I would be doing, say, 10, 15 years ago. So again, a way that our profession and our students and our residents can be involved in helping for a safer future. 2.5 million people in the United States are vaccinated daily on average. And I want you to think about this number for a minute because it, it does have some pertinence to what we're trying to get to. And that's up from 500,000 in January. The increased output should be enough to fully vaccinate 76 million people in the United States in March, another 75 million in April, and then 89 million more in May, according to estimates from Evercore. And Evercore is an investment company. So this is a business aspect on how they're looking at it. This isn't pharma sales. This isn't hopeful wishing. This is looking at the, the economics of what we have going right now. What I think is really, truly uh, very good data, or very promising data, is showing that vaccines may stop COVID transmission. But we still have some questions about it. But if we can stop asymptomatic transmission, which is about 50% of our transmissions, we have made an enormous step. So key to winning the race, according to experts, is not only whether the vaccines will play a significant role in preventing serious illness with COVID-19, which we know they all do. All three of the vaccines available in the United States prevent serious illness and prevent hospitalization, and that is remarkably important. The ideal vaccine needs to have two performance features. One prevents you from going to the hospital, going to the ICU, and losing your life. That, that's what we witnessed at, at Grady Hospital. That's what we witnessed throughout our cities, our communities, um, and Georgia at first hit in our rural areas. But if the vaccine also halts asymptomatic spread, then we could potentially vaccinate our way out of this pandemic. Think about the importance of those words, vaccinating our way out of this pandemic, life as it was prior to the pandemic.
It's estimated that asymptomatic cases, which are involved with people who have COVID-19 but who have no symptoms or they're pre-symptomatic, account for more than half of all the transmissions that we have. And that's according to the JAMA network opened by researchers and the CDC. If vaccines can block asymptomatic infection, they could also significantly reduce overall transmission, offering hope that the virus may soon be contained. Think about those words. Very promising data, new data from Israel, where nearly 60% of the country's 9 million residents have received at least one dose of a vaccine, suggested that Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine is 94% effective at preventing asymptomatic infection. And that's truly important because we talked about some vaccines that are preventing serious illness and hospitalization. According to the data coming out of Israel and Pfizer, it's at 94% effective at preventing asymptomatic infections, which cause half of the infections. A separate study conducted by researchers at Cambridge University found that a single dose of Pfizer vaccine could reduce asymptomatic infections by 75%. The results, which have yet to have been peer-reviewed, came from an analysis of around 4,400 tests conducted on vaccinated healthcare workers in Cambridge over a two-week two -week period in January. In a commentary that was published in the journal Science, by Angela Rasmussen, a virologist at Georgetown University Center for Global Health and Science and Security, and Saskia Popescu, an infectious disease epidemiologist at George Mason University in Virginia, detail why controlling symptomless transmission, asymptomatic transmission, is critical to ending the pandemic. Symptomless transmitted includes both those who have no symptoms and those who are pre-symptomatic, and we actually have addressed that in the past. Most scientists agree there are two main paths out of the pandemic. One is reaching a threshold known as herd immunity, and I will cover that briefly. And when enough people have developed antibodies from natural infection or from vaccines that future outbreaks are unlikely. The other requires clamping down on the spread of the virus so much that even unvaccinated parts of the population face little risk. So that's how we get out of this situation. If vaccines can protect against asymptomatic infection, they could help us with the latter, but the two strategies shouldn't be mutually exclusive. So literally, vaccinate all we can. If there are some areas that there's not, try to control the virus as best as we can. Think about outbreaks. If the virus can be adequately contained, aspects of life could return to more normal, even if parts of the population are still unvaccinated. So are we going to achieve 100% vaccination in the United States? That would be a wonderful concept if possible, but most likely we're not going to be there. So we have to be a little bit in a reality check. We don't need to be at herd immunity thresholds to relax restrictions. So here we're starting to talk about relaxing restrictions. If we can get the virus to be so uncommon in the population, there won't be a risk of people being exposed to it, whether they're vaccinated or not. So again, that starts by getting up to a herd immunity level of vaccination or of natural infection and making this virus go away, something in the past. So herd immunity requires approximately 70% of the population to be either vaccinated or have natural antibodies. To do this, the United States would need to administer 2.4 million doses a day by July 4th. Right now, we're at 2.5. I believe the data I heard this morning was at 2.6. So we might actually be able to get herd immunity if we can keep up the pace that we're going. But right now, there's this built up urge of people who truly want to get vaccinated that haven't been vaccinated before. So that's one group that's really going to have to go and address those who have vaccine hesitancy something that the ADA has published on, something that other groups have published on, on how we can be a role to try to get over vaccine hesitancy. To achieve herd immunity before Labor Day, say the numbers go down, it would be 1.9 million doses per day. Remember where we're at. And to reach herd immunity by January 1, 2022, the U.S. would need to vaccinate 1.2 million per day. So the goal is to get to that 2.5 million or 2.4 million per day, keep it to that level so we can return and have a really pleasant summer. Our biggest barrier is, of course, overcoming vaccine hesitancy in both rural America and communities of color. 
more than four in 10 healthcare workers have not been vaccinated. And to me, that's a problem. A nationally representative survey of 1,300 frontline healthcare workers conducted between February 11th and March 7th showed that the challenges ahead for vaccine advocates to try to persuade a larger population with less familiarity with medicine to get vaccinated. Barely half of frontline healthcare workers, we're talking about 52%, said they had received at least their first vaccine dose at the time they were surveyed. So here's a poll that came from the Washington Post and the Kaiser Family Foundation. Uh, many healthcare workers have yet to get the coronavirus vaccine and some don't plan to. So here's that 52% who have had at least one shot, 19% scheduled or planned to, 12% haven't decided and they're sort of waiting on to see how others react, and 18% do not plan on getting vaccinated. And these are healthcare workers. Have you personally received at least one dose of vaccine? Again, this is from that Kaiser Family Foundation poll. Uh, overall, it's that 52% number. Men were more likely to get vaccinated than women. Um, Caucasians, white people were more likely to get vaccinated than Hispanics. Uh, whites were at 57%, Hispanics at 44%, African American or black at 39%, and then other, which is usually multiple races, at a higher level at 59%. We have to get everybody up past these levels to get to herd immunity. And these are our healthcare providers that we're talking about at this point. If you worked at a hospital like I do, you are more likely to get vaccinated. If you work in an outpatient clinic, and I'm actually in an outpatient clinic at a hospital, again, more likely to get vaccinated at 64%. A doctor's office, a little bit over 50%. Nursing home or assisted care facility, 50%. And patients' homes, 26%. So these are where healthcare workers uh, worked. And then again, not all responses or options are shown at this slide. Healthcare workers are everybody. Let's be frankly honest. There are people, healthcare workers are from different age ranges, different ethnic and religious backgrounds, different political associations, red states, blue states, purple states, all of those different things. So we have all these multiple factors. But he noted that the hesitancy and disparities encumbered a range of healthcare workers from frontline infectious disease doctors, that's who I work with, who follow the vaccine science and approval process, and hopefully we've tried to keep you informed on that, to home health aides who may not have such knowledge. I will say my dental assistants, because, well, you know, we have huddle, and I talk about this not just on these webinars, but on a daily basis. We literally have one person who has severe allergies that is holding off, and one other person who's undergoing some medical conditions, but the rest of my staff has been vaccinated. And it didn't happen on day one. It took a period of time of me talking to them about it, of them seeing other people react to the vaccine, their peers, the, their one-ups, such as me, and just to see that there were no, uh, no untoward um, outcomes. Two-thirds of U.S. healthcare workers express confidence in the vaccine safety and effectiveness. So the question they ask is, how confident are you that the COVID-19 vaccines in the United States have been properly tested for safety and effectiveness? From the healthcare workers and general public, you can see healthcare workers are 25 percent on being very confident, somewhat confident at 39 percent. So confident level is 65% for 64% for healthcare workers and 65% for the general public. So I think that the transparency of the vaccine production and getting the information out and, and, and trying to address people's fears on how we got here so fast is actually working. We have 65% who are truly confident that the vaccines are safe and effective. However, there's still a significant percentage that are less confident. Amongst healthcare workers, 21% were not too confident that they'd been properly tested for safety and effectiveness, and 15% not confident at all. In the general public, 17% not too confident, and 18% um, not confident at all.
So if we can get those that are not too confident up into the confident side, not all, but a portion, we can reach that herd community. The herd community means 70% get the vaccine or have natural antibodies. Here we're seeing that at this present point in time, 35% aren't all that confident in it. So we just need to move the needle a little bit. Reasons that people give for hesitancy vary. They often revolve around three core ideas that we just talked about, safety, efficacy, and trust. And remember, our patients trust us, and we are ways that we can get our messages across to our patients. About 8 in 10 healthcare workers who are not planning to get vaccinated against coronavirus who were on the fence said they were waiting to see how the vaccine affects others and were worried about adverse side effects. And that is something that I've heard in my own staff. About two-thirds of those unvaccinated and without plans to get vaccinated say they did not trust the government to ensure the safety of the coronavirus vaccines. The government funded this. Pharmaceutical companies, which makes the medicines that keep many of our family and friends alive, the medicines that keep all of my patients alive. When you have to understand that HIV is a chronic disease and people are on lifetime medication, um, the government had a role in creating one or two of the medications, but here they just funded it. These were pharmaceutical companies that had the money to do the research and to get these vaccines to you. Is each of the following a major factor in your decision on whether to get COVID-19 vaccine a minor factor or not a factor. So here's what people amongst unvaccinated un healthcare workers who are unsure what they said. 82% worried about possible side effects. 81% wanted to wait and see how others did. And 65% don't trust the government. So let's try to get this not being the government's doing this. It's our pharmaceutical companies, which I know sometimes people look as, as not our friend for based on cost and things of that sort. But when you see two major companies working together that are normally competitors to try to address a major pandemic in the United States and globally, things are changing, at least in the vaccine world. What are pregnant patients need to know about COVID vaccines? We have covered that in the past, but when you looked at the data and you see that women were less likely to get vaccinated, maybe this is a bit of a concern. And this is again from Dr. Bicuspid. There's no evidence demonstrating that vaccination negatively affects pregnancy, breastfeeding, or fertility. And this is according to Dr. Swami, a maternal fetal specialist who's associate president for research and vice dean of scientific integrity at Duke University. Pregnant women are at increased risk of severe COVID-19. Pregnant patients with symptomatic COVID-19 are at increased risk of more severe illness, including admission to intensive care units, the need for ventilation, and regretfully death compared to non-pregnant peers. Comorbidities such as obesity and diabetes further increase the risk. So we really need to get this message across that if you're planning on getting pregnant, you are pregnant, the vaccine is not going to interfere with that. If anything, it's going to make sure that you have a more positive outcome as well as your child. There is no evidence demonstrating that vaccination negatively affects pregnancy, breastfeeding, or fertility. Based on the mechanism of action of these vaccines, which we have known now for over a decade, there is no risk for, in, for lactating women or their infants. Again, another important point. There is no evidence that any vaccines cause problems with fertility in women and men. Again, a very important point. However, obesity, cardiovascular disease, and other factors mean that 75% of the United States adults are at risk for severe COVID-19. How do we avoid the risk? Well, there's masking, which we're still continuing to do. There's hand washing and social distancing. However, the number one way is to get vaccinated. So if you see 78% of white adults are at have at least one risk factor for severe COVID-19, about 76% of black adults have at least one risk factor, and about 72% of Hispanic adults or Latino adults. So a lot of people are at risk. 
The most prevalent risk conditions are defi as defined by the CDC are obesity, age 65 or older, and chronic kidney disease. An estimated 6.2 million individuals, 14.5%, have heart disease. Among these, virtually all had at least one additional CDC risk factor, up to 98%, and those had at least two or three risk factors, the researchers wrote. So again, it's important, and I, and I also have the uh, sourcing down here as well as the email, it's important to realize that a lot of adults in the United States are at risk, why it's so important for people to get vaccinated. The CDC has actually, so let's go to variants because there's so much information about variants. You hear that this state has this first case of this variant or that state has this many of that variant. So the CDC and the WHO have created a threat level for COVID variants. So this will help you really keep an idea of what these variants mean. The criteria is meant to clarify just how much is known about recent challenges to circulating virus, and so they help convey risk. The news designations are variant of interest, variant of concern, variant of high consequence. So what is a variant of interest? A variant of interest has caused discrete clusters of infections in the U.S. or other country or seems to be driving a surge in cases, so maybe what we've seen in um, parts of Europe right now. It also has gene changes that suggest it might be more contagious or that may might help immunity from infection or vaccination. Therapeutics and tests may not work as well. So this is a variant of interest. So we're watching three of these right now. A variant of concern has been proven through scientific research to be more contagious or to cause more severe disease and may also reduce the effectiveness of therapeutics and vaccines, just like the first one we discussed. People who have previously had COVID-19 may become reinfected by the new strain, and that's something we're seeing in a few cases. And right now, the CDC is tracking five of these variants of concern. The B117 variant, which was first identified in the UK, the P1, first detected in Japan and Brazil, the B1351 variant, which was first reported in South Africa, and two more variants which have been spreading in California. So these are variants of concern, meaning that they might be more contagious or might cause more severe disease. Variants of high consequence causes more severe disease and a greater number of hospitalizations. It's also been shown to defeat medical countermeasures such as vaccines, antiviral drugs, and monoclonal antibodies. So far, we do not have any variants of high consequence. So what we are doing is we're looking for variants of interest, which are discrete clusters that may cause certain problems. Then we have variants of concern, and those are the ones you hear about on the news or read about in the articles, those five variants that we're tracking presently, and variants of high consequence. And if you do hear that, then really go back to March of 2020 and do every precaution possible that we really need to ensure our safety. So here is a graph that I have, a chart that I have um, from many sources at the bottom of the slide. And you can see that the B117 is more contagious, but it has minimal ability to evade the vaccine. And that's one of the variants that we're seeing, say, in Florida. The B1351, first identified in South Africa, yes, it's more contagious, and it could possibly evade the vaccine. There's a moderate ability there. The P1 from Brazil, again, more contagious. Uh, available, available ability to evade the vaccine is moderate, and it's as a vaccine of concern. There's one in New York that is one of interest, uh, two in New York actually that are of interest, but they have not reached that level of concern. Um, we have several that are under investigation, so we're really stepping up our, our surveillance of these uh, variants, but right now they're not the major um, cause in the United States, and if we get vaccinated, then we can reduce the risk of these variants causing a problem in the future. There's an, uh, a study that was done between December 19th, 2020 and February 9th. It's a pre-publication from New England Journal of Me Medicine. And what they looked at was they were testing asymptomatic patients or healthcare workers every week to check for asymptomatic infection. So literally having to go through a test every week for a period of time. 
And what they found was the rarity of a positive test result 14 days after your second dose. Remember, it takes two doses for the mRNA vaccine is encouraging and suggests that the efficacy of these vaccines is maintained out of the, out of the clinical trial setting. So out of 4,167 people who they followed from dose one to dose two, and then two weeks after dose two, only seven zero converted. So that's really good news. The data underscores the critical importance of continuing our public health mitigation measures. We're not quite at party time yet, but we're getting closer. So the masking, physical distancing, daily symptom screening, and regular testing, even in environments with a high incidence of vaccination until we reach that herd immunity. Remember, 2.5 vax, 2.5 million a day will get us there for July 4th. And the last, one of the last slides I want to show, um, this is showing on my favorite entertainer's birthday. This is Diana Ross's birthday. And um, uh, someone brought me this magazine. It's Town and Country. has a picture of Diana Ross at Studio 54, and it says, Remember Fun. Get ready for a comeback. If we do our part, fun will return. Our lives will become more normal. And I think that is something we all need to shoot for. So I want to thank my colleagues for all they have done. I also want to thank the people behind producing this and allowing me to speak to you for an annual basis. That has been an honor for me, and I'm very grateful. And we know that one of the things that people like to do is get their questions um, answered. So our next episode, which is going to air in two weeks on April 9th, is actually I'm going to be there with Dr. Severance and we're going to try to answer your questions live. So please submit your questions ahead of time. Um, we can play some of the game we like to call Stump the Dentists, but on this case, try to get those questions in so we can really address your concerns and also help inform us on what we need to be conveying in the future. So thank you as always for your time and attention and I'm turning it back to Dr. Severance. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Resnick, for your clinical update. As always, if you have any questions, concerns, or ideas for future content, please email us at webinars at henryshine.com. Our next episode will feature a live question and answer session and is scheduled for April 9th, so keep your questions coming in. And please subscribe to our Henry Shine YouTube page by clicking subscribe below. Until we see you again, stay safe and stay informed. Music